Well, good morning. Nice to see y'all this morning. A new year, a new day. Are we glad that we worship a God who renews and restores and redeems and gives us new opportunities like today? A God of new beginnings, a new creation, of new heavens and new earth that the old does not remain, but rather we are always called forward into what God is doing next. Uh, behold, I'm doing a new thing, he told us in the Old Testament. And in Jesus Christ, we have the one who will bring about all things new. And uh, one of my favorite psalms is Psalm number 98. And it says, the Lord put a new song in my mouth, for he has done marvelous things. A new song. So today we are called to sing new songs, new songs of praise, to lift up a new way of doing things, and to be new creations as well. And uh, I don't know if any of y'all have ever tried to teach somebody a new song. It is not easy. And... Um, I remember one of the churches I served early on, I was in my 20s, they were in their 80s, and I decided to teach them new songs. It did not go well. They had been singing out of the same hymnal for, oh, 50 years, and I showed up one Sunday and said, today, today is the day we're going to learn some new songs. It was a bloodbath on my behalf. Uh, it did not go well, and I heard about that for quite a while. And um, probably like years later, they still said, if you ever bring that guitar and back into our worship space again, you know, they gave me good threats like that, like good Christian people do. And so, uh, learning new songs, is, it's not easy. And after that experience, I went and found some advice. I found a wise and old music director, and I said, so how, how would you teach them new songs? And he said, one, I wouldn't. <laughs> and then he said, but if you've got to do it, uh, you want to pick a tune that they know and put new words with it or use the same words and change the tune. You don't want to try and do new music and new song at the, and new words at the same time. And um, I just took his first step, which was don't even try. So, but as, as the people that are in the new year thinking about what's possible, I mean, it's just the fun part of the new year, like the old is gone, the new has begun, and it, it seems like new things are possible in our lives. We all are prone to making resolutions or taking steps in the right direction this time of year, thinking about how we might improve our lives or make things better for others. That's usually on our minds at the start of the new year. Or maybe we need to stop things that we know are not good for us or are harmful to other people. And the great news of the Bible, the great news of Jesus Christ, is we, we have hope when it comes to sustaining that kind of change or making those kinds of change. I mean, you think about stopping things. Like, you and I, we all have, probably have people in our lives, or we are people, that struggle to give up something we know is not good for us or is harmful to us, whether it is smoking or drinking or pornography or, or whatever the case might be. We all know people or are aware of people or maybe it's a struggle that you have faced as well uh, that they, they know in their mind, they know it's not good for them and yet they continue it, and whether that's bad eating habits or, or, or whatever the case might be, you know, lying, uh, embezzling or... Uh, any number of things, um, but yet they, they can't stop. The momentum of their past is too great to stop it, or the, the wiring of their brain is so, such that it's just hard for them to quit, and we know that struggle and how difficult that can be for people that are dealing with that. And so when you look in the gospel and there's remarkable moments where people just quit cold turkey and walk away from things like that, it gives, always gives me reason to pause. You just kind of step back and go, how did that happen? You know, I've got this loved one that 
has struggled with addiction for years and they can't stop. So how did, how did God help them to quit? Or, you know, something milder even, you know, how, how did God get them to correct that or help them overcome that? Because it's not just a matter of my opinion of whether it's good or bad. It's like clearly hurting their life. And if they could stop, their lives would be so much better. Or if they could pick up this new way of living, it, it would be so much better. So, so how did God do that? And there's, there's plenty of examples of lives being changed in the Bible. Uh, probably one of the more remarkable ones to me early on in the Gospels is uh, just John the Baptist, that God said, John, John, you're going to be the one that goes into the world and you're going to change people's lives. You're going to go out there and you're going to proclaim the good news of, of the Messiah that is coming. And like some of the examples that God gives or the angel gives is, you know, you're going to help fathers who are away from their families come back to their families. You're going to help people that are on the crooked path go back to the straight and narrow, you know. And John does that. And the remarkable phrase that I always loved in the Bible is like, it says, everybody in Jerusalem, like the whole town came out to be baptized by John. And in the Greek, everybody means everybody. Everybody came back to be baptized, which means that John had that powerful gift and that ability to talk to people and say, look, the things that you are doing are hurting you. They're harmful to you, and you need to quit. You need to repent. You need to turn back to God. And uh, he called the religious folks that were hiding behind their religion a brood of vipers and, and millions. I mean, you know, so many people came back and were baptized into the faith, hugely successful at helping people change their lives. And God still does that today. And, I mean, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you and I can be deeply convicted and we can all of a sudden decide in our hearts and our lives that we no longer want to continue on with habits or behaviors that are harmful to ourselves or others or start something brand new. I mean, that's what God still does today. And when we think about that, I mean, maybe... Maybe your, your thoughts are smaller, you know, maybe you just want to eat better or get out of debt or, you know, learn a new song. I don't know. But we're going to look today at John the Baptist just a little bit because John has some amazingly good lessons about how does that happen. And you're probably familiar with the third chapter of John, uh, the Gospel of John. It's got the famous John 3.16 verse in it. It's got a wonderful conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus about how do lives change. And then after John 3.16, you get a, a little bit of story that happens with John and some of his followers, some of his disciples. And that's what we're going to look at because he, he illuminates and gives us some light into how our lives could change, how we could learn new songs or do something great with the year that's in front of us. So we're going to look at John chapter 3, and this is uh, verse, I think I'll start with verse 27. John chapter 3, verse 27 it says, John replied, no one can receive anything unless it is given from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said that I'm not the Christ, but that I'm the one sent before him. The groom is the one who is getting married. The friend of the groom stands close by, and when he hears him, he's overjoyed at the groom's voice. Therefore, my joy is now complete. He must increase, and I must decrease. The one who comes from above is above all things. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the, from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all things. He testifies to what he has seen or heard, but no one accepts his testimony. Whoever accepts his testimony confirms that God is true. The one who God sent speaks God's word because God gives the Spirit generously. The Father loves the Son and gives everything into his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever doesn't believe in the Son won't see life. But the angry judgment of God remains on them. So it's a passage for today. 
And just to give you a little bit of context here, like I said, John was very successful. John the Baptist was very successful getting people to come, repent, change their lives. He would baptize them. They would leave forgiven, free of the burden of their guilt and their shame and all the things that you and I tend to get burdened and weighed down by. They would leave the Jordan River redeemed, refreshed, and ready to go and worship God. He was very successful, and yet he always said, I I'm not the big deal here, right? You, you may be coming out, lots of this might be successful, but, but I'm not the real reason for, for why you should be excited. John was always very clear, and he said, you know, the one who is coming, the Messiah, Jesus, I'm not even fit to untie his sandals, and he's the one that you should be looking for. All I got here is water to baptize you with, simple water. Uh, he'll come and baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit, and that is worth being excited about. And the disciples were probably John's disciples, the one that followed John, were probably always nodding their head like, okay, boss, sounds good, whatever, this is working. And then Jesus actually comes into the scene John baptizes Jesus, and then Jesus' ministry begins, and people start to follow Jesus. In fact, some of the disciples that were following John start to follow Jesus. Some of the people that used to follow John now follow Jesus, and that's where we get to in this scripture is that people have shifted, people have changed their allegiance. They're now following Jesus, and John's disciples come to him, and they say, hey boss, bad news? Numbers are down, giving's down. I don't think we're going to be able to afford your locust and honey from Whole Foods anymore. Um, we're going to have to make some new plans because our numbers are not going well. They're all over there with Jesus. And here's, here's where I want to focus in. This is the place where you and I would come up with all kinds of schemes, right? Right? We would, we would be breaking out the marketing books and saying, how can we beat this, right? We would be coming up with a plan. We would be thinking, how do we get back in the market? How do we get these people back, right? You and I, when we're struggling to figure out what to do with our year, we're probably thinking, how can we scrounge? How can we come up with a plan? How can we think of a scheme that's going to make us more successful or, or make us better or improve us? But, but notice what John does. John instead has a whole different focus, doesn't he? John says, no, this is what's supposed to happen. This was the plan all along. Numbers come, numbers go, people come, people go, money shows up, money disappears. The important thing, and what John focuses on here, is what does God want? What does God want to see happen? And John's abundantly clear, he's abundantly focused, and he says, God wants people to know who Jesus is and to follow him. And so when this moment arrives and the disciples are all talking to John about, hey, maybe we need to get a better water fountain or something, come up with a plan, boss. John says, no, we, we, we're doing what we're supposed to do. And he has this fantastic line. He says, he must increase, and I must decrease. He must increase, and I must decrease, saying he must become stronger, and I will become less. That was John's hope and his ambition. As you think about your year, do you have that same thought about your life? I mean, John had a testimony and a witness about who Jesus was and, and why he mattered and, and what should be done about it. And I just ask you that simple question about your life as well. Do you have that same thought that no matter what challenges face you or what reality comes about this year, do you have that same resolve that I just want to see God honored and blessed and to do what God has called me to do. Whether people cheer me on or people boo me or it brings success or it brings a struggle, 
Do you have that same resolve that John did that say, I just want to see Christ increased in my whole situation. If that means that I have to decrease, then so much the better. And that is a key part of how our lives actually can change. I mean, and we, thousands of years later, we still talk about John the Baptist, right? I mean, what if John had shown up on the situation and he said, okay, guys, Jesus' numbers are greater than mine. The more people are following him, and it's the start of a new year, so let's lose weight, get out of debt. Come on, church. Uh, what else we got? Exercise more. What did you say, cuss less? What was that? I'm sorry. You know? <laughs> I mean, what have you done that? You know, come up with all the, the New Year's resolutions that you and I tend to come up with and then abandon by Valentine's Day, right? And instead, he had a whole different focus, and he said, ah, I've got to decrease so that he can increase. And you and I would say, man, that sounds good, but, you know, are, are we sure we can trust what Jesus has called us to do? And John anticipates that question. He knows what's coming. And so he shares his thoughts on it. And he says, not only must I decrease, but he goes on. He says, the one, this is verse 31, the one who comes from above is above all things. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all things. He testifies what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. But no one accepts his testimony. And John's saying, Jesus is coming to the world and he has a testimony, he has a witness, he has a statement about you and I and about our world. He has a statement, a testimony, a witness about you and I and the world that we're a part of. He has a proclamation, a, uh, a word that he shares with our world. And John says, but, but most people reject it. But most people reject it. That Jesus' words are utterly clear, perfectly understandable. But most people reject it. Jesus' testimony about us is that we are called to be the salt and light in the world, that we are supposed to turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, be generous, forgive, serve, rejoice, be happy, uh, love the life that we are given. Jesus' testimony about us also says that we are sinful, broken, prone to wandering and going astray. Jesus' testimony, his word about us is that we are sinners, that we fail, that we fall short of the glory of God. I mean, that's his testimony about us, and John nails it. He says, but most people reject his word. Most people reject his word. John said, I got to decrease so that he can increase, and part of that is I receive his testimony about me, his word about me. I accept the facts that he states about me as true. And maybe you're like me, you, you struggle with that too, to receive the testimony, the word, the truth that he brings in my life. And it's not just him that I am prone to ignore and dismiss. I mean, I remember a couple years ago, my wife and I were evacuating from one of the hurricanes here, and we were in two different vehicles. And uh, loaded down with kids and pets and all the stuff you take with you, right? And um, we were heading up to East Texas, and we got to Zavalia. Y'all know where that is. I'm probably saying it wrong. Got to that little place south of Lufkin. Does that help? South of Lufkin. And uh, there was a traffic jam, as they're prone to be in evacuations. And um, we both had the same technology. My wife and I both had phones. My wife way smarter than me, followed the directions the phone gave her. Me, I said, the phone is wrong. And I went the other way. My wife got to where we were going like three hours ahead of me for some reason. And uh, I got to enjoy supper at some restaurant I didn't want to eat at because we were so far behind on the path. 
And you and I know that pain in one way or the other, whether it is we have been told over and over again that one of our habits or behaviors is harmful to us or we really need to try something new, it all comes down to the question of should we trust whoever it is that's telling us? And John says, you should trust Jesus. He says, Jesus' words are from on high. They're from heaven. Like, you know, there's man's testimony, there's other people's testimony, there's the witness of two people. He says, but this guy is from heaven. His words are from God, uh, that he is the one who can bring the good news of God into our lives and into our world. His testimony is worth believing and that we should follow it. And he says, and if we do, it brings us life. It brings us life eternal. Or we reject it and we remain in God's wrath. Now, depending on what tradition you grew up in, maybe you're in a spot where you grew up and all you ever heard from your preachers or Sunday school teachers was that you were wicked and evil and that you feel guilty and ashamed every time you hear Jesus' words because you don't think you measure up to them, that you dealt with a whole lot of shame or a whole lot of guilt when you were growing up because uh, you just never felt like you were enough. And so when you grew up, you found a church that was more about grace than about talking about sin or wrath. And I just want to point out to you, if you are hearing what I'm saying about following God's will, about doing Jesus' words, and you're starting to feel guilty and ashamed, stop. You're getting it wrong. You're basing your worth and your salvation on your track record, on what you have done or haven't done. And the good news that we have today, the testimony of John and all the others, is that our salvation is based on what Jesus Christ has done for us. That he came into our world to live the life that we could not live, to die the death that we could not die, and he was risen so that we could be a people who are forgiven and have life and life eternal. As Paul says, there is no condemnation in those who follow Jesus Christ. There need no, does not need to be any shame or guilt about our behavior or what we have done today if we are in Christ Jesus. The old is gone and the new has begun. It's time to start anew. So today, as you think about your year, maybe you put aside some of those resolutions. Maybe you begin to think about your next steps toward Christ. Maybe today is the day that you join the church. Maybe you need to be baptized. If you've never been baptized before, we can do that for you. If you have never been a part of the church in terms of serving, this would be a great step for you to take forward. Uh, or if you've never been part of the Methodist men or some other part of our church, we'd love for you to be a part of that. Maybe you need to start a daily devotion time each morning, reading a little bit of the Bible, spending some time in prayer, listening for God's word and thinking about how to apply it to your life. Or maybe if you've got one of those deeper struggles that we mentioned earlier on, maybe this is the week that you get some help, seek out some people that can help you. Whatever the case is, we are a people who are called and invited to give our lives, all that we are, to Jesus and trust that he will make the best use of our year and our life. And today, um, I don't know if we got it into this service, but John Wesley has a covenant prayer on page number 607 of the United Methodist Hymnal. And um, I'm not seeing it come up on the screen, so y'all can look that up later on Google. Let us uh, move into the time of communion. Oh, now it's here. Thank you, Google. So this is the covenant prayer of John Wesley. And we're going to pray it together today, kind of like we do the Lord's Prayer. So let us pray. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. 
Let me be employed by thee, or laid aside for thee, exalted for thee, or brought low for thee. Let me be full, let me be empty, let me have thi all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father and Son and Holy Spirit, thou art mine and I am thine. So be it, and the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. It was on the very night which he gave himself up for us that Jesus gathered together with his disciples. And after the meal was over, he took the bread, he broke it, he gave thanks to his Father in heaven, and he said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after the supper was over, he took the cup, and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for the sins of many. Do this in remembrance of me. Most gracious Holy Spirit, we pray that you pour out upon these gifts of bread and wine. May they be for us the body and the blood of Christ, so that we might be one with Christ, one with each other, and one in unity to all the world. Until that time comes, Lord, when we feast together with you and your heavenly banquet, our honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forevermore. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray in the way that he taught us to pray. Praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Will those assisting me in communion please come forward at this time? As they are coming, I would just like to remind you that this is not a Methodist table or a Rick's table. This is the Lord's table, and all are welcome. Even if you're visiting with us for the first time today, you're more than welcome to come and receive both the bread and the cup. 